So good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully this is just your first call of the day. <laughs> um, but uh, we have Sylvia here from the Tamarack Institute. Um, and this is the start of our uh, system change learning series that we will walk through um, with Sylvia and the Tamarack team. Um, this is the, the whole purpose of this series is really to um, just build our understanding and capacity around systems change, understanding what it is, how we engage in it, um, you know, how we can really practically step into systems change here in Snohomish County. Um, so this is kind of the, the kickoff, um, if you will, of that series. And today we'll, I mean, Sylvia will talk about this more, but um, we're talking about navigating disruptive times. Um, so keeping an eye on system change, you know, knowing that um, just with everything that has happened with COVID and all the things, <laughs> um, you know, that, that it's uh, easy to um, get super focused on kind of, um, programmatic stuff right now. Um, and so just, just reflecting on, on what it has looked like and, you know, how we can keep a system mindset in the midst of that. Um, so today on the call, we have, uh, representatives from our five core collaboratives. Um, and then, uh, we have some United Way staff members as well who are able to join us. So welcome to you all. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, and then, uh, our members of the United Way board are also, um, joining just as we all, um, continue to learn about systems change. Um, so the way that this series will work, um, we have webinars and we have deep dive sessions. Webinars are... Um, kind of hour long learning sessions and then deep dive sessions are for groups of folks to go just to really kind of dig in to, to what um, we've learned. So um, we'll do for, for kind of this series, um, the uh, routine will kind of be like two webinars and then one deep dive session and then two webinars and one deep dive session. And this series will go through November. So um, I'll remind everyone at the end, but I will be uh, sending a calendar and um, invites for um, the next few your way. So keep a weather eye open for that. So with that, I will turn it over to Sylvia. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to meet you all. I have had the pleasure of having a couple of conversations now with Lark and then with Elise. To learn more about your work, I have to start by saying how impressed I am with the work of each of the five collaboratives and also with this approach that you've chosen around really allowing the collaboratives to adapt and focus their work based on what communities, the communities that you are based in, are seeing as really critical and top of mind. Um, just a little bit um, about me is that I work with the Tamarack Institute for Community Engagement, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in just a sec. But I came to find Tamarack because I was like you, living and working in a rural region. I'm actually based about an hour and a half northwest of Toronto. And um, I got pulled into being the coordinator for a regional collaborative that was focused in our um, rural area on building community well-being. And we had a really diverse kind of definition of what that meant and then championed a range of different projects, um, either to promote healthy people, a sustainable uh, environment, of um, a dynamic economy, vibrant arts and culture, and engaged citizens. So I kind of understand the rural dynamic as well which is why I've dialed in on my phone because I too have the joys and pains of rural high speed, which I think is a bit of an oxymoron. But I'm hoping that our technology gods will be with us today and all will be well. So as Elise said, really what I want to do today is um, frame out the work that you're all doing through a lens of really appreciating the, the disruptive times that we find ourselves in and giving some insight and allowing you to reflect together to identify both strengths 
opportunities and challenges around how to make the best of and navigate um, your planning in the context that we're in, which is just it's so incredibly disruptive. So um, I do want to start. We at Tamarack have um, made a real commitment to our country's truth and reconciliation process. It is a journey for us. Um, but we, um, as part of this practice, really want to take time to acknowledge that uh, the indigenous uh, folks whose land, who have been the stewards of the land that we are meeting on, and that as settlers, just want to acknowledge our gratitude to them and to the generations of Indigenous people who have cared for the land that we find ourselves in, and that we also see as settlers the importance um, of recognizing the contributions of Indigenous people, and overtly um, want to just articulate our collective commitment to fulfilling that challenge um, in our work. So to go ahead a little further, this is me. I will add contact information because I really, this is an adaptive series. We have a rough um, roadmap of the content we want to cover, but I always welcome feedback, questions, whatever, because that enables me to work to continue to refine the design as we work forward so it's the most helpful and supportive to you. If you know nothing about Tamarack, the thing you need to know is that we are a national charity um, operating in Canada, but increasingly have a learning network that spans um, the US, uh, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as many other countries around the world. And um, our learning center has really kind of focused in on what are the key ingredients that we know support long-term positive community change, and we have identified five. Collective impact, which is that very disciplined form of multi-sector collaboration is one. Authentic community engagement is the second. Collaborative leadership, so how do we share leadership between and across different sectors and different players? The importance of community innovation and what do we mean by that and how do we nurture that? And then ultimately the importance of evaluating and learning continuously from these experiments and prototypes that we work on together. And um, a powerful community change agenda in our experience really comes from braiding these five practices together. And so over the course of our learning journey together, we're going to take a deep dive into these elements and help you kind of consider what insights you might want to draw from these five practices to strengthen your own collaborative work. And much of our experience in community change is rooted in what began almost 20 years ago for us with five local centers, each developing their own tailored local plan to reduce poverty using a collective impact approach, multi-sectoral uh, shared leadership approach. Um, in the intervening 20 years, this network of five communities has grown to be over uh, 300 a member learning communities who are using an array of strategies, but the same broad approach of multi-sector engagement and mobilization to advance agendas on community change. And this is where a lot of our systems change work comes from. Because you'll see when locals get really clear about what they're going to do, many of them begin encountering similar policy and system barriers, and then they can work together at a networked level um, on a coordinated strategy to address some of those conditions as well. Okay? But we can talk about that a little bit further. Let's start, though, with a poll, if you don't mind. Um, I would like to ask you, looking at each one of those six pictures, if you had to pick one to describe exactly how you're feeling right now on this early Monday morning, go right ahead and chime in and let us know how you're doing. Mm -hmm. We're about halfway there. I'll give it a few more seconds. Give you 
just a couple more seconds for the folks that have just sort of started to settle in. Mm -hmm. All right, let's put an end on that. I just want to show you where people landed with that question. And I'm actually going to catch the question itself um, and grab it so I can have a copy of it as well. Um, but look at that. So the overwhelming majority of you are feeling like that tangled ball of string. 38% uh, of you or nine of you. And then a number of you see yourselves as the people leaping across the stones, number four. But you know, what's interesting to me is that there is there are folks that have chosen virtually every um, option on that continuum. And that's really an important thing to note, right? Because what we know for sure is that we are all all over the place in terms of these disruptive times, and so are the folks that we're working with and working for, right? And so it's really important to keep that in mind as you move your own work forward. We are all at different stages and different places in this journey. Um, so what I really would like to do with us today in the hour that we have is really drill in a little bit further to consider uh, the impact of the disruptive times that we're living in and give you all a chance to individually take stock in terms of um, your recent response to what's going on with respect to the pandemic and other things, and then have us have a chance to reflect together on what can we make as we look at how we've responded so far what ahas are we starting to see? What opportunities, what challenges, where might we need to be thinking a little bit differently um, so that we can step forward into this uncertainty with a bit more clarity. Um, and uh, through that process, we'll sort of introduce you to some tools and frameworks for how to come at and think about this stuff. So I think to start, um, I really wanted to spend some time really acknowledging the, the disruptions that we're living in and why opportunities for community to come together and innovate and be creative about their responses are particularly important. What we know is that what we're seeing is significant and frequent disruptions. So this idea that we can plan for a whole year, kind of roll out that plan and hold true to that plan without having to adapt it is probably less realistic. Um, that many of the changes that are happening and that are impacting us, we cannot directly control. And there's an overwhelming um, flow of information. We can, you know, fear for some is tangible. We're seeing folks uh, legitimately kind of acknowledging that this place of panic and perhaps victimhood and certainly a feeling of overwhelm and how to make sense of this, right? That tangled ball of string is very real. Um, and so just needing to acknowledge that these are unusual times is the starting point. And what we know um, from the Clemmer Group and others is in the face of change, even if we actually are not in direct control of a lot of it, we can absolutely hold on to how we choose to respond. Um, and there are three kind of positions that people divert to. And some of this is like personality, some of this is your, um, your lived experience, but some people naturally go to the navigator role. So how can we capitalize on these changes? Where are there real opportunities we can see? There's the survivor mentality, which is just hunker down, stand still, and let's wait and see um, what we can tease out here and what we, you know, what our options are. And then the third stance we could take would be one of a victim. You know, again, powerless in the face of this, there's nothing we can do. Can do. We just have to kind of um, accept what's happening and be reactive to that. And so the opportunity and challenge for us, first for ourselves, but then also uh, within our working communities, is how do we help people move from that sense of victim to you know, that sense of 
getting clear on what really is happening and seeing and joining you in opportunities to act effectively given what's important and what you value. So my colleague Liz Weaver just wrote this really lovely paper and a link for it at the bottom which is about thinking about what does collective impact look like after the pandemic. And what I really, really liked um, in how she kind of framed out her paper was the identification of these three distinct stages to how people typically navigate disruption, right? So the first is there's a response, right? It's like an emergency, we have to act. And so it's really about dealing with the immediate crisis. You're mobilizing, um, things to preserve safety and security of folks best you can. And that it's important to acknowledge that for many of us, because we don't just wear one hat in our world, we're probably experiencing this response on multiple levels. So there's that, you know, personal, you know, what do I need to do to take care of my family response. There's also an organizational, depending on your role, you know, uh, what does this mean for our funding? What does this mean for our staff? How do we take care of the people that we're committed to serving? And then it's also about thinking about yourselves as a community and what do we know is needed and how do we adapt as an organization or as a team our response to both reflect what we understand of what people now need and our own strengths and capabilities. So after that initial sort of reactive response, then we go into a time of recovery and you're starting to hear people talk about it, right? Like what does recovery look like? How can we prepare for recovery? And I think it's a critical time to pause and reflect on what needs to change and what needs to stay the same and not to assume that we can, that recovery equals going back to exactly the way we were working before. It, that may not be possible. So really critical to pause and um, adapt and maybe reprioritize some of the work that we do to better reflect the emerging and new needs that we're seeing out in the community. And we may also begin to identify um, some new possibilities for ourselves as an organization and or for our collaborative work that we hadn't necessarily baked into our plan at the get-go, but we're beginning to see will position us really well or is responding to a really critical need that we hadn't considered. And it's really important that our plans reflect and adapt to that. So it's really going back and rooting in your core purpose, but then also taking a critical assessment of the assets and capabilities that are at your table. And given um, the core purpose and the assets and capabilities, are there opportunities for us to complement and or upgrade what we do, either internally with our own team or through strengthening certain collaborative relationships we may already have in place? And then lastly, and I think this is also a really critical um, insight, is we need to, once we start doing that critical reassessment, the lens that we need to be holding is what do our communities need to be strengthened? How, you know, Typically, um, crises like the pandemic reveal not just short-term needs, they also are very good at making visible structural flaws in the systems and services and programs and networks that we are all part of. When things are humming along beautifully, you know, we tend to not see those structural flaws and or we tend to accept them as inevitable. But when everything else is being thrown up in the air, there is a real critical opportunity for us to advance change in such a way, there's a greater receptivity, I think, if we can get ourselves organized, to address long-standing structural inequities that exist in our communities by, and, and building the internal strength of our communities to better navigate these kinds of times as well. So really looking for where those strengths are in our community and how we amplify and support those. And then also really looking for where might there be an appetite now, because everything is changing, to address some longstanding issues that before the pandemic people may not have wanted to consider. Make sense? Okay. Um, my colleague Mark Bosch, who does a lot of work with Tamarack, 
um, has this really nice way of sort of visualizing what happens during a disruption. So we are humming along, you know, things, if we're this little ball, things are pretty even, Stephen. There's a little few bumps, but generally things just keep humming along. All of a sudden, kaboom, there's this great disruption. In this case, we're thinking in terms of the pandemic. And so as we're living through that and we're trying to plan forward, we have a number of potential pathways we could follow, right? So one is we can try and get back to bump back into that former equilibrium. We may not have a lot of control over ensuring that that happens, but there's certainly a temptation. What of what we've been doing before the pandemic really makes sense for us to continue to do. There's a possibility of finding a new equilibrium. So finding a new normal, right? And then humming along in that way. And or what we may see, and what we also have to be planning for, because we don't know which of these outcomes is going to play out, um, sort of more disruptions all along the way, right? So it's important to sort of think about that. What are we planning for? And knowing that all three of these are possibilities, how do we maximize our strengths as we navigate those? That's where you find your path forward. And then lastly, I'm really loving, this is um, an editorial published by um, a real thought leader that Tamarack has done a lot of work with. Um, and one of the things that he said is, if you actually stand still and notice, there are probably all kinds of innovations going on that the community has just strung together because we need to take care of each other, right? And we need to deal with the reality in front of us. And so part of our work as we think about the future is also to look around and seeing the ingenuity that is showing up in our community and asking ourselves, how do we make the best of those new solutions that people have created just to respond to this reality, things that are likely to stick, right? So really he's urging us to unify within and across movements, really be, um, look for who are the connectors and bridge builders um, it within and amongst our network and how might we align our work to support theirs and vice versa. You know, what kind of uh, caring society do we want to be? So a disruption invites us to go right back to those core heartfelt principles beyond an incremental change and say what's needed now and what's really critical for us to drive forward. Really thinking about how we engage people's hearts as well as their minds and invite all of the community in um, to contemplate what kind of future we want to co-create together. And really reimagine our contracts with government and other funders in ways that advance equity and justice. So it isn't just about returning back to the status quo. How might we recover in a way that grows and strengthens our commitment to equity and justice? And then lastly, um, what are what are the learning what are, are we learning and how are we capturing our own insights so that we too are evolving our own capacity to work through uncertainty together? All right. One of the most critical frameworks that I love to think about to help make sense of um, complex and disruptive times is this Kinefin framework. Is anyone familiar with the Kinefin framework? Have you seen it before? Well, let me walk you through it. Because I think what I, what I love about it the most is it says any challenge that we are looking at before we dive in and start brainstorming potential solutions to it, it's really important that we stand still long enough to diagnose what kind of an issue or problem are we hoping to, are we trying to address? Be and why this is important is that depending on the type of problem that we identify ourselves as trying to fix, that affects the solutions that we want to be using in how we fix it. So let's walk through. So there's a type of issue that is a simple or obvious issue. We know what the issue is and we actually know how to fix it. It's really, a, so the relationship between the cause and effect is 
obvious and there's a high degree of agreement between and amongst a diversity of people that this is what works. Perfect example would be hand washing to reduce the spread of disease, right? Doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what country you're from. If you do it, it's going to work. So this is the realm of best practice. It's really about understanding the best practice and then just making it more and more obvious to everyone and encouraging compliance. Complicated problems, just above, are a slightly different type of problem because the relationship between what's happening and what's required uh, and what, how to get the result we are hoping for requires a bit more analysis and or investigation. And there's not necessarily agreement between and amongst us around how best to address it. This is the realm where experts can really help us kind of figure out what it is we need to do and can help um, make the path more obvious to us. This is the realm of good practice. Great example for me, putting on a play. There are lots of component pieces that we have to sort out and align together to put on a great play. But we have a rough sense and from the expertise of others um, that there are about seven core ingredients that we need to figure out. We need a great script, we need a great set, um, we need great cast, we need a great director, we need great tech, sets and props, marketing. That's it. Once we get those six, seven pieces figured out in the, re, uh, the context of our own play and we click them together, things should work really well. Complex problems are a fundamentally different type of problem because the relationship between cause and effect, A, is dynamic and often can only be seen after the, the fact. So this is the realm of the emergence. This is where we need to sort of do our best, a good enough assessment of what we think is needed based on conversations with the diversity of folks. We need to um, kind of take action and sort of note the response, right? We need to probe, stand still, make sense, try a few ideas, prototype a few things, see what happens. The stuff that we really think is working, gonna work well, we amplify. The stuff that didn't work so well, we step back, learn from, and tweak. That's often the realm of work in community on, co on complex issues because there are so many different contributing factors and frank, quite frankly, from one place to another, there's so much variance that an initiative that works brilliantly in one place can be a uh, catalyst for us thinking about, oh, well, what, what if we did that here? But we still have to adapt it to the reality of where we live. And then the final component, this chaotic one, is that the relationship between cause and effect is really much more at the systems level. We may not initially have a lot of control over the system, but we really need to be paying attention to how the dynamics of the system are influencing and affecting our work, and how do we dance well with shifts and changes in the system. So this is where that community innovation stuff really comes to the fore and has us thinking differently. So I'm going to pause there for a sec and open up the line. I'm just wanting to make sure, before we go further, that folks um, if you have questions, you're welcome to either um, unmute yourself and chime in or type into the chat box if you if you prefer. Either is fine. It can be a question, a comment, an insight, an aha. Any of those things are welcome. People are very quiet. Anyone seen that Kinefin framework before? I do think it's a really helpful one for sure. Oh, 
Oh, you guys, you're very, very shy. Waiting for the Monday morning coffee to kick in, maybe. That's okay. Um, thanks, John. I'm seeing a comment from John here where he's sort of saying, no, the framework itself is new, but it does feel very intuitive. Yeah, I would agree. But it's helpful to actually have it as a visual because I think you can really have rich conversations, um, even on your team, about what kind of problem do we think this is because that will influence how we might want to approach it. And building that under shared understanding can often be really critical to moving people along together well. Um, Sylvia, on that framework, um, it was for the, uh, I'm trying to remember the title of everything, but there was. Do you want me to go back to it? Uh, if you could, that'd be great. Um, yeah, let me, let me just pull it up. Um, oops, where is it? There, can you see it now? Did I make it visible to you? Nope, maybe not. Uh, there we go. There it is, yep, yeah. can you see it? Come in, there we go. Um, under the simple obvious, category there's best practice and under complicated there's good practice um yeah you might have mentioned that and it just uh like went over my head <laughs> but um can you explain quickly what why like best practice goes under simple obvious and good practice goes under complicated? yeah i think for me best practice goes under simple and obvious because it's something that we know will hold true no matter where we are so if you think about, um, there's a high degree of agreement amongst all of us about in this situation what we need to do. Um, and there's a common agreement that it's going to work. Like we know it. So that's why things like hand washing would be a great example. It doesn't matter where I live. It doesn't matter who I am. If I do it, it's going to work. Right, so that's really simple. And often the work in the work that we do in community, there's elements of all of these types of issues and problems at play, right? But, um, you know, things like, for example, um, you know, that would be one example. A complicated um, situation, again, is one where, um, there are a number of different variables. Some of them may be consistent and true, um, no matter which community we're talking about. Um, but different communities come to the table with different histories around an issue and or different resources. They've been able to attract the superintendent of the school board, for example, into the work of one collaborative, whereas in a different jurisdiction, what you may have is the school board sort of standing more on the periphery and being more, um, kind of cautious about the degree to which they want to collaborate. And so given that the issue that you're dealing with, you know, might involve school, schools working well with you, um, you know, there's a good practice that says we've got to get the schools involved, but the degree to which two different identically kind of focused collaboratives might be able to advance that agenda may look different depending on who the players are, right? Um, from one yeah. place to another, the data that's available, who knows, you know, there's different variables that show up. And so it's helpful to take a look at a really promising initiative that has had tremendous success in another jurisdiction, similar to yours, but you're still going to have to make sense and analyze what of that may, is applicable and transferable to your context and what might not be. Right. And even when you get it clicked into place and you get it running for a little while, you know, a change in leadership in one of the organizations or amongst one of the key partners, that might shift things a little bit as well, right? While things get up to speed and the new person gets in place, that kind of thing. So there's, we know, like collective impact would be a perfect example. It's actually the articulation of a good practice, right? Um, but what that good practice looks like when we take it and apply it in our community 
in the context of our issue is going to look a little bit different. So having people experience this collective impact that can come and help and be guides and help you think that through is useful and helpful, fabulous, but it's still, it's a good practice. It's not going to guarantee, it's not a recipe that yeah. guarantees I put in three, you know, three spoonfuls of common agenda and two spoonfuls of, you know, shared measurement and ta-da, it's going to work. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. And then the complexity one is sort of more, you know, we're still, it's, it's like complicated in that we're still trying to make sense of and respond, but the world around us is dynamic yeah. at the same time, right? So that makes it even more challenging. Okay. Well, let's go then. I'm wondering, can I ask you, all of you, to take five minutes and just jot down on a piece of paper in front of you, thinking about the last several months, say from March, when the pandemic really started to kind of show up on our radar till now, what sorts of things have we been able to accomplish in terms of, of responding to the needs in our community? And that can be either individually or it can be as, a, as your collaborative. Um, Flagging for yourself what you're aware of as missed opportunities and or real challenges that you've encountered in trying to adapt and respond in the need to the needs of your community. Um, and what I can do, if you like, I'll give you a few minutes to just sort of think this think this through, but I can capture when we're ready. Um, I'm happy to capture with post-it notes, um, uh, and I'll share with this, this with everyone afterwards, sort of what have we accomplished, what are some of the missed opportunities, and or what are some of the challenges. So just take a few minutes and think that through, and then when you're ready, I'll invite you to start helping me populate this a little bit. So who has an accomplishment? Um, who's had an accomplishment that you've seen in the community's response to our changing times that you think we need to capture? Could be as your organization, could be as a collaborative, either or. I've unmuted everyone, but you might have to unmute yourself just to shout that out. Always hard to be the first. I like the, what I've noticed is the community outreach, the offering of masks, um, supplies, additional food, um, just the coming together of the community to provide for the, for the community. One thing I've noticed is everybody seems to be admitting, I don't know if that's even the right word, uh, their own mental health issues and the difficulties they're having and there's not a lot of judging and blaming and stuff going on but there's a lot of inclusion it feels like um so more understanding right like it's a it's a shared experience in some ways okay. yeah and i i think the thing i heard that was the most reflective was we're not we're all in the same storm we're not all in the same boat but we're all in the same storm and so we're kind of helping people to move forward even if you know we're 
more privileged or we're less have less mental health issues or whatever you know we're still all trying to help each other through this i love that expression i hadn't heard that before but it's a really great articulation anyone else what are some of the accomplishments um in terms of what you've seen the communities be able to do what you've seen your organizations or teammates be able to do we've pivoted to new ways to communicate like what we're doing today mm, oh dead on and did it fairly easily yeah yes well, we did denise isn't agreeing with me i don't think <laughs> i didn't have a camera when this started and it took me three well i got one i borrowed one from some friends at jim where jim works but it took me three months to actually get one <laughs> so well, we're glad we can see you today. <laughs> um, Anybody else? Sylvia, we have in the chat a couple responses. Oh, good. Uh, can you read them out? Yes. So um, from Jessica, we have um, partnering with uh, Volunteers of America, so another local organization to turn their community center into a pop-up food pantry and that's um, at a particular location on uh, Casino Road here. In Perfect. Town. Um, and then uh, from Teresa Terry um, at the ARC, um, she said that they found a greater response and engagement by having virtual meetups. Um, so seeing a positive from that. From Catalina um, with our Casino Road Collaborative, um, huge efforts to stay connected with families and connect people to resources. Um, from Kendall, um, shifting very quickly to meet basic needs, um, those really kind of concrete needs like rent assistance, food, so really being super quick on their feet. Um, Perfect. Yeah, from Deb, we just have two more. <laughs> I'm from, oh, three. From Deb, um, we have changed uh, to modified services, providing early education remotely. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'll let you finish typing. <laughs> um, we have cross collaborative engagement to share resources. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, we have some challenges listed here, but I'm assuming we'll yeah let's go there then i think okay. that that's where we need so miss uh, uh let's go to challenges if that's what you're seeing yeah. what are, what have people identified um let's see here well we have one more on the yellow um okay we can come lots, oh, i can i can change that yep sorry <laughs> um lots of research and staying in contact with peers and other service providers to update what is out there and how to access it So a much better sense then of the landscape of options. Mm -hmm. So what are you hearing as challenges? What are people saying? All right. Um, issues with spotty or no internet. I know that's been, I mean. Oh yeah. Challenging for folks in all our collaboratives, but in particular our rural collaboratives. Um, what else? Issues with being uncomfortable with technology. Mm. Yeah, people having varying levels. Yeah. I keep having Zoom calls with my mom where she, I, I watch her ear because she keeps <laughs> to her ear. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> you're like, can you just move the phone a little to the left? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, from Deb, um, isolation has been a big challenge. Which it looks like there are a lot of nodding heads with that one. Mm, yep. Um, individuals uh, who had needs had difficulty in getting information from service organizations. So sounds like kind of connecting with services. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, from Janae, who works at Refugee and Immigrant Services, um, making sure that our English as a second language customers are able to navigate virtual services. Mm. Mm. Yep. Um, partner capacity to engage in collaborative work. Oh, okay. Or the lack thereof of the capacity. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, oh, relapse in the time of no sober support meetings. So, oh, yeah. Have they moved online, any of them? Some, I'm seeing Karen, you're nodding. Yeah. Any missed opportunities that people have noted? Um, I'll keep reading what's in the, what's in the chat and we can see. Um, let's see, we have Karen mentioned the lack of in-person contact is detrimental to preserving relationships um and really negatively impacts mental health yeah um there's been a study that shows that um risk of dementia goes up by 64 percent amongst people that are isolated and alone wow but that's one kind of component yeah huh. um from jim uh he mentions delays all over the place. Something that have been really difficult. Um, yeah, I, especially I, if you're working with folks that don't have a lot of resilience, right? Yeah. Around, um, like they, they don't have a lot of capacity to navigate those uncertainties. Yeah. Um, from Terry, um, fear of funding cuts and individuals' fears of losing services. These might still be under the challenges category. Right. I think they are. I'll change this one. Hang on. No worries. Um, right. Um, we have um, access to services and resources for undocumented individuals from Catalina. Um, from John, sorry, I'll get you. Yep. Um, from John, um, the restriction and limitations on the ability to just drop by and say hi. <laughs> so kind of tied to that yeah. part. I know that I definitely, I'm one of those people that in the office, I like to just stop by people's desks and it's hard <laughs> not being able to. There's a magic that happens sometimes around the water cooler, right? that yet we haven't found the way to kind of figure out yet. Yeah, um, from Elizabeth, increase in domestic violence during this time has been a challenge. Because everybody's in such a pressure cooker and more isolated for sure. Um, okay. From Sarah, we have lack of direct family leadership and programming. What does that mean? Um, Sarah, do you want to leadership and programming? Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining that it's, um, 
just the ability to have like families present in the conversation, like at the table to, uh, got it. Uh, you know, yeah, Sarah, that's what I was getting at, cool. especially right. when things have to change very quickly and we haven't, you know, felt like there's the time, I guess, to, to reach out and pull families in who could provide really useful direction. You know what? I'm tempted to make that one green almost, mm. you know, because it's a myth. It's a missing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. I think that's where I originally, Oh, um, sorry. I typed it for that one, but it got moved down. That's great. Um, that's a good, so, that's a good. Yeah. So, so for missed mm -hmm. opportunities, we have a couple written in here. Yeah. Um, so not all funding is going to the best place to be distributed from Jim. That's interesting. Okay. Yep. Um, missed opportunity for schools to utilize partners to meet student needs. Beautiful. Okay. Um, missed opportunities to support older adults who may be isolated and a lack of resources um, in general for that population. One of the groups that I was working with in a, a small northern community mm -hmm. um, mobilized because they were connected to a community college, mobilized all the disappointed students who were supposed to have placements mm -hmm. and created a um, virtual check-in on isolated seniors hosted by the students as part of their virtual placement. Um, oh, cool. And they mobilized, so they put two needs together in a really creative way to address specifically that need in particular. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm mindful of time. Does that kind of feel like a good juicy list to start? I'm sure we could continue to grow it over time. But what I would really like us to do right now is mm -hmm. just take a moment or two and think about the next piece, which is what are the, when you look across this list um, of accomplishments, missed opportunities and challenges, um, wondering about um, what strengths and assets are you kind of seeing revealed here or needs and gaps that um, like what's the pattern you know when we've responded well what's really helped facilitate that positive response what else or what more might help or do we need to be thinking about so just some big high level takeaways which i would welcome from folks Anything striking you? And or maybe that's what we need to pick up on next time. So if I can get this, because I'm mindful of time, if I can get this out to you all in terms of really taking a look at what you've said as accomplishments, missed opportunities, and, in, and challenges encountered, I would really encourage you, um, and we can pick it up, I think our next session, let's start with checking in on, you know, being really intentional about saying, what are the strengths and assets that we know exist that we could leverage? What are we getting clearer about in terms of priority needs and gaps that we need to be thinking about and um, adapting our strategy around? Are there some important enablers um, that, that have helped us to get things done? Where they've were, um, and what structural might be revealed. Long term sort of structural issues that we may need to sort of put um, higher on our list of actions, strategic actions, because um, there's an appetite now as we think about rebuilding. Great. 
Okay. Now I just want to bring us back because I'm just going to bring um, wrap us up here um, and would invite you um, before going off, if you could type one word or phrase into the chat box that for you summarizes what you're taking away from our exploration today. And then Elise, if I can turn it over to you maybe um, to think about um, where to from here, what, what next. Yeah, so while folks are typing um, into the chat box, um, our next, as you can see on the screen here, our next um, learning series webinar will be on Wednesday, September 9th at 10 a.m. Um, so be on the lookout. I'm going to do my best to not just overwhelm everyone with uh, calendar invites. So we'll be sending invites out uh, several weeks before each um, learning opportunity, but I'll also be sending out the full kind of calendar. Lark and Molly and I will be sending out the full um, kind of calendars so that you can mark your calendars or mark your, yeah, calendars <laughs> um, for what's upcoming. But um, yeah, with, with the second webinar, we'll really dive into um, collective impact and, you know, more of the, the you know, practical application of, um, that kind of theory and structure. So, um, and then yeah. for the first deep dive, we'll build on the, the insights that you've generated today to really help shape how do we then start reimagining what our work could look like and might look like to really leverage the reality of the time that we're in and acknowledging that. Thank you all so, so very much. I will make sure that you get a copy of um, the chat box log, um, the, this slide deck uh, for sure, um, as well as the recording and uh, the, the post-it note posting. So you've got that as a reference. And I look forward to continuing to learn with you in September. Thank you so much. Thank Bye you. everyone, have a super day. Thank you.